In June 2021, an Australian scientist bought the cheapest fish fingers he could find, sliced them into thin pieces, and put them under a microscope. He found that the much-loved frozen food contained what he reported as a fair amount of microplastic, which if consumed, he worried could be ending up in and affecting organs in the human body. In March of this year, for the very first time, microplastic pollution was detected in human blood samples, not just in one or two of the test subjects, but in almost 80% of people that they tested. There is a now debunked figure floating around the internet at the moment that people are consuming an average of a credit card worth of plastic each week. That figure isn't quite accurate, but still the results are shocking. When scientists analyzed the blood samples of 22 anonymous donors, all healthy adults, they found plastic particles in 17. Half the samples contained PET plastic, which is commonly used in drinks bottles. A third contained polystyrene used for packaging food and other products. And a quarter of the blood samples contained polyethylene, the material used to make plastic carrier bags. When scientists looked at blood samples taken from babies, they found that microplastics are present in 10 times higher quantities in infants compared to adults and that babies fed with microplastic bottles are probably swallowing millions of microplastic particles every single day. These are the 21st century symbols of the coming plastic apocalypse. But although our bodies can't break down microplastics, researchers at the University of Queensland recently announced their discovery that there is a creature that can. It's the hero we needed, but not the one we deserved, Zophius Morio, more commonly known as the Superworm. Hi, I'm Dr. Ben Miles. My job is to help scientists turn breakthroughs into technologies that tackle these sorts of problems. Today, we are looking at how superworms can save us from the impending plastic catastrophe. But let's start with a quick bit of background on what is a microplastic. Plastics, to begin with, are a type of polymer composed of chains of repeating units, which can be partially organic or fully synthetic, but are usually made from oil or natural gas. Microplastics are tiny pieces of plastic defined as anything less than five millimeters in length. They are broken into two categories. Primary microplastics, which are intentionally manufactured in the size of a microplastic for either industrial abrasives used in sandblasting or microbeads used in cosmetics and skincare products. Or they are secondary microplastics, which are formed by the weathering of larger plastic items, particularly after those large plastic items have been released into the environment. Plastic was, and is still by many, viewed as a wonder material. Cheap to produce, strong, durable, the features that we prize it for are ultimately the features that make it so difficult to deal with. As tiny particles abrade from plastic containers or packaging material, they enter the environment and they become lodged in the organs of small organisms. These small organisms are eaten by larger organisms and so on until ultimately they are eaten by us. We now know as of the last couple months that these particles can travel around the body and may lodge in our organs. The impact on our health is as yet unknown, but researchers are concerned as microplastics cause damage to human cells in the laboratory setting. And they are similar to the air pollution particles that already are known to enter the body and cause millions of early deaths every year. Given that plastic pollution is expected to increase in the coming decades, there is a dire need to develop sustainable recycling and upcycling processes for this waste which includes the common materials such as polystyrene, which is used in a vast array of products, anything from styrofoam cups to packaging peanuts. These measures are fine for slowing down the rate at which plastic enters our environment, but who or what is going to reverse the damage that has already been done? Enter our hero for the day, the superworm. Researchers from the University of Queensland recently proved that superworms can survive on a diet of pure plastic, polystyrene specifically. To reach this conclusion, the team divided 171 superworms into three groups with different diets. One was fed only wheat bran, another fed only polystyrene, and a third was put on a strict fasting or starvation diet. In a slightly morbid note, the study noticed that instances of cannibalism among the fasting superworms led them to modify their experimental design housing and contained the starving control group animals in isolation, whereas animals in the other two groups were housed together during the feeding trial. At the conclusion of the trial, some of the worms from each group were set aside to grow into beetles. Nine out of a total of 10 bran-fed worms successfully grew into beetles and maintained the most diverse gut microbiome of all three groups. No major surprises there. The bran-fed larvae were significantly healthier than their plastic-fed or starved counterparts, more than doubling their weight over the three weeks that they were monitored. The plastic-fed larvae made less impressive gains, but amazingly, they still put on weight and two-thirds of them grew into beetles. Clearly, although polystyrene is a poor diet for the larvae, 
they? They are actually extracting at least some energy from the material, at least sufficient to gain weight and successfully turn into a beetle. Now, although here we are shining light on these superworms, the real hero is the bugs that live inside the bugs, the microbiome present in the digestive system of these superworms, because it's the bacteria that makes itself at home in the worm's gut that actually does the majority of the breaking down or hydrolysis of these microplastics. Plastic is a polymer made from long chains of repeating units of carbon and hydrogen monomers. These chains potentially contain a lot of useful energy, but are difficult to break down because of the strong carbon bonds that ultimately give plastic its durability and its strength. The way the body, or in this case the bacteria's body, accesses this stored energy is with a specially designed class of proteins called enzymes that have a particular shape and a particular function depending on the type of cleaving or breaking action that they are trying to do on a particular polymer. So these enzymes in the gut of these superworms have probably evolved specifically to help the worms break down polystyrene. The scientific team has made some initial guesses as to what those enzymes are that are helping these superworms break down the microplastics, but there's been some pushback from the scientific community suggesting that the proposed mechanisms wouldn't quite do the job. So some further work is currently being undertaken to actually understand the enzymes that are taking action. So instead, let's look at some general enzymes and how they break down a different sort of plastic, PET or PET, discovered in some bacteria that were living in a landfill in Japan. After PET was ingested by the bacteria, an enzyme called PETase or PETase first breaks PET at specific points in the chain before MHETase breaks it down further into its monomer components. Here there are a couple of outcomes that you can hope for. Either the enzymes break down the polymer into its monomer components, which would allow you to make new plastics from these raw materials. So in theory, you wouldn't need any further oil and gas resources to make any future plastic product if you could make this process 100% efficient. Essentially, it would create a circular economy. Or you hope for a different outcome, that the polymer is broken down into something truly digestible and that the energy contained in that polymer is absorbed into the bacteria and then into the superworm or whatever organism it's in, providing it some amount of sustenance. The danger here is that some of the chemicals in that plastic aren't fully broken down and are absorbed into the bacteria or into the superworm, contaminating them, but early indications seem to show that this doesn't happen. Now, before you get grand fantasies about the future world where valuable substances are excreted and harvested from a band of roving superworms, which sounds like it would make a great story, it's very unlikely that these worms will be the most efficient way to solve our plastic pollution problem. Instead, researchers will probably look to identify the enzymes involved in the process, culture up large batches of them, then incorporate these enzymes into bulk plastic collection and recycling processes to allow them to tackle the problem at scale. Another thing to keep in mind is that these enzymes work for polystyrene and polystyrene alone. So we need to find or engineer other enzymes for our other types of plastic waste. Once we have found them though, or at least early versions of these enzymes that seem to do the job, probably we'll start to go through rounds of optimization where either genetic evolution or potentially AI is used to produce an enzyme that operates as efficiently as possible. And this is partly to deal with the volume of waste that we have, but mostly to make the whole operation actually economical. As unfortunately, still most recycling approaches have low uptake and ultimately burying plastic in the landfill kicks the problem a little bit down the line for future generations to deal with, which has been a pastime of humanity for a while now. Having said this though, it does seem like nature is doing its best to give us answers to this plastic invader. Back in 2012, students from Yale University discovered a rare species of mushroom, the Pestilotiopis microspora, that can eat plastic. This fungi consumes polyurethane, one of the main ingredients in plastic products, and breaks it down, converting it to organic matter. I guess the word of warning though should be that we shouldn't treat this and nature's efforts to solve the problem for us as a signal that it's all going to be okay. We've got some really promising first innovations and nature is doing its best, but even optimistic projections say that we're probably going to see plastic pollution increase a minimum of 2.8 fold in terrestrial systems and about 2.6 fold in aquatic or water systems by about 2040, even with the full portfolio approach that implements a range of different solutions to try and tackle plastic waste. Although hanging some of our hopes for the future on the superworm and the mushroom, it's really important that other innovative solutions come to market to help us tackle these sorts of problems. What do you think? I would like to know down below in the comments section are some other solutions that we can take to help rid the environment of plastic waste. 
If you're interested in finding out more about the bacteria found in a landfill in Japan, I made a video which you can find somewhere on the screen here. Thank you very much for watching. I will see you next time. Goodbye.